Hello, James here. How, how you guys doing? Hope you're doing well. Well, I ain't gonna take too much of your time. I'm gonna show you a couple of videos about the black male high unemployment rate. But I'm also gonna give you some things that which you guys, black men and black women, that you probably don't think about. So hopefully, this, this video will inspire you to think. Because this, this was going on right now. Over the last three years, with the high and three thousand or so rate. trades, and he had a win rate of. During this holiday season, give your loved ones a gift that keeps on giving for the rest of their life. Torpedo Pot is the only affordable self-growing flower pot that ensures your future food survival. All you do is add soil, seeds, and seedlings to the flower pot, and watch your plants grow. The Beauty Pot can grow nutritious food in such abundance and variety that you can produce more food than your local farm. Visit www.torpedopot.com. So, there's been a report put out about the U.S. economy in relation to black men. Now, black men in the workforce, or the lack of black men in the workforce, has definitely hurt the U.S. economy. So they're saying black men are still having a hard time landing employment. But it's not because black men are lazy, okay? Because, you know, you have people, the white supremacists, that say black men are lazy, when we know good and well, they are the king and queens of lazy. Because if, you, if they weren't the king and queens of lazy, then they wouldn't have had to go get Africans to come... Uh, build up this land because remember there were colonies in America prior to the landing of African uh, people okay that they brought over here to enslave and their colonies that they had they failed they those those European settlers were complete failures so they were failing so much that they had to cannibalize each other do you understand so America didn't even get built or, or nothing it was sustained until Africans had to come over here and do it. So, so we know that how lazy they are. That they were lazy for two hundred and what fifty years or so. That's how lazy they are. Black folks ain't got no no head start on that kind of laziness. Now, they said the unemployment rate for black men was seven point three percent in November twenty twenty one, compared to three point four percent among white men, according to the Labor Department data. Now, about 697,000 black men are still looking for work. They say even as the U.S. recorded 10.6 million vacant jobs in November. So the fact is, companies still aren't hiring black men and not hiring them to fill open job results in 50 uh, billion being lost for the U.S. economy. Okay, so even though all these jobs are open, they're still not hiring black men. Why? Are black men not qualified? Black men don't have the education? What is it? Why is it black men aren't being hired? Okay? Now, black men are excluded from the workforce due to racist hiring practices, as well as being killed in prison at higher rates than other groups. And that's done by design. Now, that was found uh, by a study by the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Yes, black men are heavily policed because you have to understand, the black community, if you do the research, right, the crime, any crime that happened is economic. Once you get to the middle class of black people and up, crime is literally non-existent in the black community, right? They don't police white men that way. White men out here dealing drugs, human trafficking, uh, 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 anything you could think of, they're doing, right? Using drugs. They don't jail them. There's, there's no crime bill for white people. You have to understand, black men was was mass incarcerated through crime bills, that, especially the last one, that was pushed by Jim Crow Joe and Bill Clinton, your Democrat friends. But you know, you, can, you can't say nothing wrong about, the, about your Democrat friends at all. Oh, it, don't, it don't matter what they do. It don't matter. It's like, it just, it's just amazing to me because... I heard a phone call, oh my God, I heard a phone call uh, from, from uh, I think it was a, uh, a 
caller, I think I was on Tariq Nasheed's show. Uh, I, was, I heard about, somebody sent me a link to. And if that's the average Democrat voter that's black in America, I see why we losing. If we gonna stay losing. We gonna stay at the bottom. Oh my God, the ignorance. Anyway, so these kind of people that vote Democrats in all the time, no matter what, who, no matter who, are just as racist as anybody else. And in and, and, and the Democrat Party, they want to push the single motherhood. They want to push programs for single mothers. They don't want men. You understand? They don't want no men in the household. That's the big thing about them, the breakup of the family. So they do not want to focus on men, black men in particular, being hired on jobs. Now, they said the void of black men in the workforce has a ripple effect. They say it negatively impacts black men and their families and their community, and the country loses billions a year. Now, let me stop right there. No matter what you think about black men, if black men are economically sound, if black men are doing good, then the black community is doing good. But what the Democrat Party has done is say, let's go ahead and try to elevate the black woman over the black man, because see, that's the most racist thing they ever pulled, and the most divisive thing they ever pulled, because they know that women do not lead a community. Women cannot lead a community like that. No, it is the men. Listen, it's, it's what God said in order. And when you're out of order with God, that's why things don't work. You can complain about patriarchy or whatever. That's the way God set it up. God created, because most black folks, now you talk about you're Christian now, you're going to church every Sunday, you're giving your tithes to Rev, so what I'm about to say should be in line of, of just about 100% of you. If, if, if the Lord created man, and then he made woman because he said that it is not good for man to be alone so let me create woman right to be a help meet not to be the leader not to do it for the man to assist the man in what he's doing right to, to do the things that women do because according to what the bible teaches most of you black people say you believe in we all have a gender role to play now you let the devil come in you know, the, the, and, and we know who the devil is today. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad told you who is the devil today. It's not hard to figure out who the devil is today. I ain't got to spell it out. You can figure out who the devil is today. The devil told you that it's wrong for you to have uh, your, your black man leading the household. The devil told you that you as a woman should get a job and you should do this and you should do that. And now the consequences of, of listening to the devil once again have women in sorrow. Even back in the Bible time, you listen to the devil and, and, and it brought in pain and childbearing and death. Listening to the devil now, now you can't even get married to save your life because you chose career, you chose to listen to feminism and everything that the devil told you to do against your man. And now look what's happening today. I'm, I'm just saying, but you say you believe in the Bible, though. I'm only talking about those who believe in the Bible. Because I know how some of you are. Some of you believe in the Bible to the point that when it starts getting at you by, by what you're doing wrong, that's why you don't want to listen to the Bible no more. But some of you love the devil way more than love God. But, oh, that's, 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 a, uh, that's a whole video for another day. Okay? So, think about it. Every woman that has a, a, a brother, especially a husband, let's say a husband, because no one's going to say no man. A husband, and that husband do well for himself, and that husband can take care of the family, and she don't have to worry about much of that. That is the most relaxed woman, the most stress-free woman, all of that, okay? If the collective of black men are doing good, then the black community is going to do good. That's why I had to go down that route, okay? Now, they say that if the government focused on closing the black-white jobs gap, it said we can add 30 billion annually to the black community and make significant reduction in black poverty. Okay, uh, they said that the figure increased from 30 billion to 50 billion in factoring in black men of prime working age who die or incarcerated in 2020. The incarceration rate of black Americans in local jails was 465 incarcerations per 100,000 of the population, the highest rate of any ethnicity according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics. 
once again that's done by design look look at look at the things that we have reported on the police take forever to go arrest a white man because they don't want to they let them get away with so many different things you got to catch them on camera and something that's just completely horrible for them to go to jail and they know it they know it's, it's, it's a law for you and they know it's a law for them just as much as I said in my in my promo uh, for uh, the passive aggressive racism in the system of white supremacy book that I wrote one of the first ones it is two separate laws in this country and white folks know it that's why they love listen let me tell you something they, they love this country more than life itself because there's no country on earth that will allow them to get away with what they get away with hell they can't even go to certain European countries and get away with what they get away with here. I promise you that they can't. So, oh no, they definitely. Why you think they don't go over there? Why you think they don't want to immigrate to some of these European countries? Because they know good and well, even in their own, uh, their own brethren won't even allow them to get away with the things they get away with here. It is the truth. Because I, I have so many people that watch me from, from different European countries, and they write me and tell me, say, man, in my country, if they would even pull half of that stuff they pull it, they would be going to jail. We don't play that over here. Like in Germany, for instance. In Germany, they can't wave that Nazi flag. They can't do that. They can wave it if they want to. They go to jail. But over here, you can wave a Nazi flag. You can Confederate. The Confederate is, is a freaking flag of a uh, 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 traitor. You are a traitor to wave that flag in the United States of America. You are a traitor for that. And, and it should be a law where you wave that flag, you go into prison <laughs> for, for being a traitor to the United States. But they can get away with that situation here. Right? They call it freedom. No, that's not freedom, it's terrorism. Now, the Brookings Institute study from last March found that incarcerated black men account for a third of all black men uh, excluded from the labor force. They say black men have always had high unemployment they, because. If you are going to look to a white man for a job, that's, that's just P100. If you're going to look for any white company, they're not going to look out for black men. Okay? They're going to look out for their own men first. Then after their own men, then they're going to look out for the women in their community. Then outside of them, they're going to look at you know the racial hierarchy in America. Okay? So after them would be Asians, because you know Asians is right underneath them in America on the racial hierarchy. Um, then the, the darker Asians may come underneath them, like the Indians and certain ones like that, right? Um, then after them, you know, we talking about maybe some Middle Easterners, you know, could come in after that. All right. Then you would still have your, you know, uh, your Hispanic groups. Then you have your black immigrants first. Then black Americans completely second to that. And then you know, in the black Americans, there'll be black women, then be black men. Okay? So black men are at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom when it comes to hiring. Just based on the racial hierarchy in America, if you haven't figured it out yet. Okay? The reason it's going to happen until you, it, 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 when, until we as a community realize and get out of this looking to massa for everything. And this is the only reason why we're in that position. If, if, if studies and data show that you are always going to have high unemployment, black man, then what does that should tell you, black man? Oh, well, I can't go look to this man for my daily bread because this man don't like me. He has proven this for hundreds upon hundreds of years. So what should I do as a black man? I need to create my own business. I need to get me a CDL and go drive trucks. Man, my homeboy just bought a truck, the, the ones you don't even need a CDL for, and he about to start going to pick up loads, making money, right? He just invested the, the money that he had into buying a truck. Awesome thing that he did, right? You can get on social media if you want to, doing podcasts. If you want them brothers got the gifts of gab, or people really like hearing what you got to say, you're at a job, everybody always enjoy what you say, enjoy your conversation. Make that into something. Let me tell you something, brothers. Due to just the ability for me to speak, ability to me disseminate information and things that I enjoy, 
has created a great life for me and my family and taken me to places that I would have never went if I, if I only had the money when I was working for uh, 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 the folks. Understand? Premium beans for a smooth and balanced cup. That's Green Mountain Coffee Roasters. Just the foolishness of preaching, the foolishness of talking, have created income that I would never have seen in my life. I come out of Port Arthur, Texas, brothers. And anybody that's from Port Arthur that's watching, shout out to Port Arthur. You know good and well, Port Arthur is a go nowhere town. If I was to stay in Port Arthur just working a job, not making much money, it's not, it's, you don't got nothing going on in Port Arthur. You would never earn, brothers, the amount of money that you want to earn working for somebody else. You got to, when you know that in the area of employment that these people are against us as black men, or if they hire you, they don't want you to be a supervisor, you're not going to be the CEO. Let's call it what it is. You're just not going to be the CEO like that. And if you get to that point, you're going to sell your soul as a black man to get there. You will have to coon and buffoon and shuck and jive to get to that position because they're not comfortable with a real black man. They're not comfortable with a straight alpha black man. That's that's all his stuff. They go oh, there. No, they're not comfortable with you. And brothers, you know that. So they would never, 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 never have our employment at high numbers. No, it's not going to happen. So the best thing to do is to create your own business. Nobody's going to feel sorry for you, black man. I'm telling you, as a black man. Nobody's going to feel sorry for you. Even in our own community, nobody's going to feel sorry for you. You got to get it how you live. But the thing is, you are, are, are black men. You you got you are creators. You are builders, right? So tap into that. Laying around and putting up with people's things and looking at this or for a job or even looking at a female, which is so sad. Some of you black men look at Looking at females and even living on females. I don't stand that way at all. I don't. That's not what men are supposed to do. But we know the, the, the deck is stacked against us as black men economically. But we don't have to sit up there and put up with it. Sure, we call out racism, white supremacy all day. And that's fine. And we should do that. Okay? But I don't want black men to get into this where we can't do nothing about it. Man, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Just because we are black men and we deal with these white supremacists don't mean we can't live a good life, live an abundant life as black men to provide for our wives and our children. And even get to the point we can do for our mothers and fathers and grandmothers and all of that. You understand know what I'm saying? See, see, it, 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 a lot of you brothers need to be encouraged on that. Don't ever, don't ever let racism and white supremacy make you think you can't do well. You can do well. You have to want it bad, bad enough. And I've noticed that every time brothers get into doing businesses on their own, they take off and thrive. They never thrive with the white man. They just don't thrive because he don't want you to. He don't. And, and, and if you are thriving, he buck broke you on that job. How many of y'all have, have had a job in the past and they tried to buck break you on the job? Say all kind of racist jokes to you, see if you put up with it, talk to you any kind of way, put more work on you, or you you you've been doing the job for years and you train this and this this new little white male come in, they tell you to train this white male to do a job, and then you look up this white male in six months as your as your supervisor. You've been there ten freaking years, never late, always doing the right thing, and a little white male just because they know him. Uh, that the cousin or someone, or that's the son of somebody, whatever. Now he's over you telling you what to do. Nepotism. They practice so much white nepotism and all of that. So, brothers, mm -hmm. brothers. Yeah, Ben. Yeah. We take data like this. Yeah. We don't. We don't just say, "Oh, look at what happens to us as black men." No, that's not what we do. That's not what I did in my life. Let me speak about me. Yes, I understand as a black man, so many different things are against me. People don't like me or have not liked me in the past. People call me all kind of names. They still call me names now. People still don't like me now. Trust me on that. Nobody, a lot of people don't like me. 
I'm good with that. A lot of black folks don't like me for a plethora of reasons why they don't like me. Do you think that's going to stop me? Because people don't like me, talk crap about me, or whatever else they try to say about me, all that is going to do is that, that fuels me, brothers, to do what I'm doing. Understand? I know these folks don't like me. I know even in this space how, you know, we work so hard here to do what we're doing and we don't get the visibility, we don't get the shine, we don't even get the appreciation for a lot of it. Okay? But is that going to stop me from doing what I'm doing or what I'm seeking to do in the future as a black man? No. Nothing's going to stop me. As long as I got breath in my body. At times I get down, times I get upset, frustrated. I'm human. Right? But there's no excuse for me as a black man to look at anything to say, well, it's okay for me to fail. I'm going to fail my kids. I'm going to fail my family because they racist against me. They suppressing me. They doing this to me. They doing that to me. I'm just trying to call black men just to take a stand. Stand up. Rise up, black man, within yourself. And then your, your, your confidence with things like this. Say, okay, this is the, the, the future if I stay working for white people right here. Can't get a job. Can't get a promotion. They strategically put black women over you. Not because they like black women. They don't like black women at all. But they do that because, you know, they just try to cause strife and all that too. Like I said, mm-hmm. they, they the devil that the Bible speaks of. Right. I'm telling you. All so- and I'm going to interrupt right here. And it's something that uh, I, I had a job um, part-time doing driving. And uh, before I go to this next video, and I, I came to work on time, you know, it, it was delivering nuclear medication. This is back in 2021. And I came to work on time and everything. And, Want to create your own income you know, stream on Amazon? All you time, need to do is go on. And sometimes when you deliver, you got to wait uh, when it comes to nuclear med- medication. So you got to, and I get there early enough so that the hospitals be able to administrate to the patients. Um, I've always was quick. I drove a company car. I was always on time getting there. Be careful. I'm careful with the equipment. I'm very careful. You know, never drive recklessly, causing accidents. Never getting snotty with none of the hospitals if they don't hurry up on time. Anything. I do everything I was supposed to do. Till one day. Um, so so when I, when I'm not driving, you had this guy was, you know, I had to work with man, and uh, um, I had to go through some, you know, stuff because like I'm I'm doing the job the best way I know how, and it's a it's a laid back job. I kind of like it. It was part time, but that but the man, I wasn't doing something. He had to come over and say something to me about it, and I'm doing the job. Moving at my own pace. It's not like it's a, a job where you're on the semi line. We have to move real quick. But uh, um, I I could you know so I'm like I'm, you know, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. And so this one time I came back to the office, and the manager had the nerve tell me that after after I've been doing this job for a while, because what happened was. I made I, I, I made one mistake, and I, and and I went to this hospital, and it was two different parts of the hospitals. I put the um, I, I took the wrong one to, in the same location. It was the same location. I took the one the medication to put it to the other one and put the other one, and they called the manager. He got upset with me, and he wanted to talk to me crazy. You know, like yeah, hey, okay, you know, own up to it. But then he then he had to go in more and saying, and by the way, you ain't coming back on time. And and, and I said, yes, sir, yes, I am. What you talking about? And he, he kind of clowned on me in front of, in this worker. And you know what? I didn't clown. I didn't act a fool. I didn't get all emotional. You know what I did? I, I worked out my week, brought my equipment, walked out the door, and. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you ain't got to take that shit. You know, I almost had, there's times I, I let people get to me so bad.
that almost had had a nervous breakdown, and and you know someone to do something like that, and even when I was telling my friend who was white, what is this situation with? He come out and just told me he said mess with you because you were black, and I said no, and I didn't go back to that job or anything. So Phil is right, and they called up and said what's going on? Going on? So that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna let somebody do me like that. You know, I'm, 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 I'm halfway, to, you know, I'm halfway, and I'm, all, I'm halfway to hundred. I ain't got time for no, no stupid crap. And I ain't gonna leave this world early than, later than I have to. And people think because you got a certain look, you, you nice, you, you gonna be passive. No, but I, I'm the nicest guy. But you piss me off, I'm done with you. I, ain't, I ain't gonna take your shit. You know, I might look like that type. But hey, hey, I know how to walk away because I've been through this in hell, hell high water, and I've been point that I've been angry to the point that I, I like I won one time I had a boss to try to embarrass me and shit, and and I, I he made me so mad I I had to leave the job because I thought about picking up and something knocking him over the head. That's how bad he made and they push you like that, and I didn't do anything but if it was a and I see the white dudes that was doing something, something that dude. I'm looking at the whole situation. He don't say nothing to them. So I, that's what I knew. I ain't gonna work around these people. But yeah, you see that nepotism, racism going on, and that's why some, you know, some people. That's why they don't go back and work. On this free website, FireLaunch.com, you can build a passive five, six, it's not that they don't want to work, but from you got to get away from it. And I'm not saying that no some of our people don't, don't do no stupid shit too. Because we get, we, we get to fulfilling ourselves and we get on the job too. But or even testing out complicated I don't, I don't have time for that. What I'm you about get to the point, is the fastest and easiest you know, way to and I don't get mad on and go off on somebody and get emotional. Because that's, that's how they got you. Step one, open up this free Amazon Gold Mining app and it tells you how much you want to earn every month. Most Amazon sellers give off 30%. Searchers say the rise of joblessness among black men has become a crisis and its financial impacts are having a ripple effect. According to a new report from the Center for Economic and Policy Research, the toll of unemployed black men is costing the U.S. economy about $50 billion a year. Researchers say black men have consistently had the highest annual unemployment rate for the last 20 years. The report found the predominant reason is a lack of job offers. It is also impacted by higher mortality and incarceration rates. Researchers say with communities that lar uh, with larger populations of working black men experience uh, lower crime rates and better educational opportunities for children. For more on this, I want to bring in Algernon Austin. He is the Director for Race and Economic Justice at the Economic Policy Institute. He's also the former Director of the Race, Ethnicity, and the Economy Program. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I want to get right into this. So what are the factors that we're talking about contributing to this high unemployment rate? These levels of black men who, who just, you know, want to see change here. What does need to happen? Well, um, we need we need it to be a national issue. We need national attention. So it's great that you're covering this. And uh, let me clarify that the official unemployment numbers undercounts the magnitude of joblessness for black men. The moment uh, black men face a considerable amount of discrimination in the labor market because of race, because they're black men, because uh, they may be formerly incarcerated because of disability, all of these factors. And when people are rejected from jobs over and over again, they stop looking for work. The moment they stop looking for work because they're discouraged or because they're in an economically depressed community and they see that there are no jobs available in their community, the moment they stop looking for work the mo is the moment the Bureau of Labor Statistics say they are no longer unemployed. So that's what my report is looking at, looking at all the, the men, and it's a vast number uh, of, of black men who are discouraged, who dropped out of the labor market, but they are still jobless. 
they still uh, may have kids that need support. Um, and when you look at that, you see a massive, uh, of, you know, on an average year, it's about 1.4 million men. And so it's the issue of racial discrimination in the labor market, discrimination against people who were formerly incarcerated, uh, uh, discrimination against people with disabilities are, are, are three of the major factors. And the uh, economically depressed communities. Yeah, I know a lot of economists have uh, a major problem with uh, the, un the way unemployment is counted. They say it is a flawed system. But I'm curious, uh, those unemployment levels of black men running much deeper uh, than just not having a job, it it's also perpetuating the wealth gap in this country because for every month a black man's not working, that's less money for his family, which means less opportunity on a host of measures. So talk about that cycle. Absolutely. A job is fundamental. That's the foundation upon which people build wealth. If you don't have a job for the, the average black person, if you don't have a job, you're losing wealth, you're spending down your savings, you're selling assets, or you're going into debt. You know, you're you're putting things on credit cards, you're going to predatory lenders, and that just puts you further and further behind. It also, you know, can damage your credit rating, so it makes it much more difficult that you can get an asset like a home or a car um, in the future. So it really does contribute significantly to the, the wealth disparities that we see in our society. Do, do we have any idea of the mental health toll this is having on black men? or their wives and children, for that matter? This is, this is a very important question that, that you ask, um, and we need to do more research on that, but we know that joblessness is going to cause stress, anxiety, uh, can lower your self-esteem significantly, uh, particularly if you have people depending on you for support. The, you know, all of those all the mental health challenges gets multiplied when you think, oh, these, I'm letting down my family uh, because of my job. So yes, it, it contributes a significant amount of, uh, to mental health uh, stress and duress. Research suggests that if the jobs gap closed between white and black men, about $30 billion would be funneled back into black communities every year. What are the solutions to fixing this, or are there any? There are. We, we, we need to address the more effectively address the liberation discrimination in the labor market. Um, and there, we need more laws, we need stronger initiatives, stronger encouragement for employers to diversify their, their employment practices and really give opportunities to everyone, but not just to the people in their, in their networks. Uh, we see this problem uh, persistently. We also, I talked about, unfortunately, many predominantly black communities are essentially economically depressed communities. But what did we do in the Great Depression? In the Great Depression, we had the Works Progress Administration create subsidized jobs. Um, so we need targeted subsidized jobs programs to high unemployment communities. And this, uh, there are many, unfortunately, there are many black communities that have this long-term persistent levels of high unemployment. But there are also Native American communities, some Latino communities, and even some white communities with significantly high unemployment. So we really should uh, do more during the Obama administration, there was a subsidized jobs program that was connected to TANF. We can use that as a model and may just make it bigger um, and so that it can better address all, you know, the, the size of the problem. Yeah, there is the train of thought that since government contributed to the systemic uh, segregation and discrimination uh, in many of these communities, it should play a role, as you just mentioned. Uh, Algernon Austin, thank you very much for your thoughts and your research. I'm going to stop right here, but I um, want to show that part. But uh, this was the main thing I wanted to get to. And... Uh,
What did they tell you about black people? And a lot of people believe this about us. And this is where the mindset came in. Of the book, an 
African prince who desperately wants to marry a white princess. After acknowledging the differences of race, Dr. Doolittle bleaches him white, which gave off a burning brown paper smell. It's essentially teaching young black children two things. Number one, Caucasians should be highly desired by black people. Number two, and that black people should aspire to be like them, to gain their approval or acceptance, even bleaching their skin instead of embracing their beautiful, natural complexion. So is it merely a coincidence that many successful men from within the so-called black community feels the need to validate their success by marrying a Caucasian woman. The famous author and cartoonist Dr. Seuss created children's books based on minstrels. In fact, he wrote a minstrel show called Chicopee Surprised as a fundraiser for a school trip. And not only did he write it, he also performed it in blackface. Six Dr. Seuss books, including And To Think That I Saw It on Mulberry Street and If I Ran the Zoo, will stop being published because of racist and insensitive imagery. The business that preserves and protects the author's legacy said these books portray people in ways that are hurtful and wrong. See, there's a number of other songs we sing as kids, not knowing they were rooted in racism. Songs such as Eeny Meeny, Miney Mo, Catch a Piggy, By Its Toe. The actual words to this song says, Eeny Meeny, Miney Mo, Catch an N Word by the Toe. If he hollers, let him go. Eeny Meeny, Miney Mo. An alternate version of the song says this, Eeny Meeny, Miney Mo, Catch a Negro by his toe. If he hollers, make him pay $20 every day. See, the meaning of this rhyme is rooted in the transatlantic slave world war. Some refer to it as a slave trade. The inspirations behind the song is what white slave owners would do if they caught a runaway slave. There are other songs that we sang that's rooted in racism. Songs like Oh Susanna, Camp Town Races, the original ice cream song lyrics, and Abraham Lincoln's favorite song, Jimmy Crack Corn. I want to share with you another piece of dark history that should completely catch you by surprise. What you see are images of a restaurant food chain called Coon Chicken Inn. This restaurant franchise was founded by Max and Lester Graham in Utah in 1925. Utah, like much of America, has a complicated history with race. Much of the population is affiliated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which allowed blacks into its assembly, holding a lower status among the organization. A demonstration of this fact is that three black members of the church were present in the Vanguard Company of 1847, but they were used as servants. The most controversial aspect of this attitude is that black members, as well as suspected black members, according to a racial one-drop policy, were denied priesthood privileges essential to the faith until the 1970s. See, an attitude of separation trickled into Utah's secular psyche as well, with blacks receiving second-class treatment inside and outside of the church. While the creation of corn chicken is perhaps the most blatant example of this attitude, it is not an isolated example. The business immediately gained popularity. However, in July of 1927, the restaurant caught fire and burned to the ground. In a large publicity stunt, Graham rebuilt the Corn Chicken Inn in 10 days. Four years later, two additional roadside Corn Chicken Inns opened in Portland and Seattle, and a fourth branch would eventually open in Spokane, Washington. The massive cone head served as the entryway to all four of the restaurants. The chain flourished for nearly two 
decades until Graham closed the branches in the late 1940s. As early as 1919, Southern and Minstrel themed fried chicken restaurants were attracting Seattleites. Attracting. So that's what they say, huh? That's how they see us, right? And therefore, they got. They, so they put an image so you won't think that that's what your people are. But let me turn around and let me show you what they lied to you about black people. Did you know black people were inventors? We heard a lot of stories about people who changed the world with their amazing Watch idea this. and inventions when we were growing up, both in school and outside of it. But then we didn't learn more about the important accomplishments of black inventors and the important things they made. People of African descent, like people of any other race or culture, have made important contributions to the growth and ease of life we enjoy today through their amazing innovations. So in this video, we present to you a list of 100 inventions made by black people. Number one, in 1881, Lewis Howard Latimer made the first electric light bulb with a carbon filament. This made electric lighting possible by making the incandescent bulb last longer. It changed the way we light the world. Number two, Garrett Morgan came up with the three-way traffic light in 1923. This three-way traffic light brought order to crossings, making them safer and giving drivers a standard way to control traffic flow. Number three, in 1990, Lonnie Johnson came up with the Super Soaker water gun. Lonnie Johnson's Super Soaker water gun became a classic summer toy by using innovative pump action technology to deliver strong water shots and endless fun. Number four, in 1887, Alexander Miles invented automatic elevator doors, which made it safer and easier for people to use elevators and get in and out of them. Number five, John Purdy invented the folding chair in 1889. It was a movable way to sit that was easy to store and move, making it useful in a variety of situations. Number six, Frederick McKinley Jones's creation of the refrigeration truck in 1940 changed the way perishable goods were shipped by keeping them fresh and extending their shelf life. Number seven, Andrew J. Beard made the rotary engine and got a license for it in 1892. It uses circular motion to make mechanical power, so it can be used in a lot of different ways. Number eight, Garrett Morgan made the first gas mask in 1914. It kept people safe from dangerous gases and was an important piece of safety gear for industrial workers and emergency situations. Number nine, in 1940, Charles Richard Drew came up with the idea of a blood bank, which changed the field of medicine by making it possible to store blood and use it in situations and treatments. Number 10, in 1897, John Lee Love made a movable pencil sharpener that made it easy to sharpen pencils on the go, making it a useful tool for students and artists. Number 11, when George T. Sampson invented the clothes dryer in 1892, it changed the way people did laundry by making it easier and faster to dry clothes. Number 12, the peanut burger was invented by George Washington Carver. Number 13, Marie Van Britten Brown created a home security system in 1969 that used closed circuit TV and remote tracking. This system was the first of its kind and set the standard for current home security systems. Number 14, in 1891, Philip B. Downing invented the locker, which made it easier and safer for the post office to send mail. This made collecting and delivering mail more efficient. Number 15, T.J. Marshall's new traffic light, which came out in 1923, had a four-way stop feature that made it easier to control traffic and safer at crossings. Number 16, Roy Clay created the software for HP's first computer, the 2116A, and headed the team that brought it to market in 1966. Number 17, Dr. Patricia Bath's laser FACO probe, which she made in 1986, changed the way cataract surgery was done by making it safe to remove cataracts with laser technology. This helped millions of people see again. Number 18. In 1872, Thomas J. Martin's new design for a fire extinguisher made it easier to put out fires. This made firefighters more efficient and safer. Number 19. The carbon microphone, which Granville T. Woods invented in 1884, changed the way people communicated by turning sound into electrical messages. This led to better communication technology. Number 20, Lloyd P. Ray created the dustpan in 1897, making it considerably simpler to get stuff out from beneath the rug. Number 21, Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson's touch-tone phone, which came out in 1973, got rid of rotary keys and replaced them with keyboard buttons, making phone calls faster and easier. 
Number 22, Charles B. Brooks invented the street sweeper truck in 1896. This made it easier to clean the streets, made towns better, and improved cleanliness. Number 23, in 1893, Thomas W. Stewart invented the mop. Number 24, Ralph Sanderson invented the hydraulic shock absorber in 1926, which improved vehicle comfort and stability by decreasing the effect of bumps and vibrations. Number 25, J. Standard's refrigerator design in 1891 revolutionized food preservation, enabling the storage of perishable items for extended periods, improving food safety and convenience. Number 26, Dr. Mark Dean was a key player in the development of computer-aided design, Kiad technology in 1986, which changed the fields of engineering and design. Number 27, Granville T. Woods' telephone transmitter invention in 1889 improved telephonic communication by enhancing the clarity and range of transmitted sound signals. Number 28, Dr. Philip Emiagwali's work in 1989 helped make supercomputers possible. This increased the power of computers and made it easier to do difficult scientific studies and models. Number 29, Alice H. Parker's central heating system, which she came up with in 1919, changed the way people felt in their homes by making heating more efficient and easier to manage. Number 30, in 1943, Rufus A. Wheeler invented the stair climbing wheelchair, which made it easier for those with mobility issues to ascend stairs. Number 31, in 1893, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams conducted the first successful open-heart surgery, ushering in a revolutionary medical treatment that has since saved countless lives. Number 32. In 1949, Phil Brooks invented the disposable syringe, which revolutionized healthcare by offering a sterile and easy method of dispensing drugs and injections. Number 33. Dr. Patricia Bath's creation of the touchpad in 1986 established a user-friendly interface for computer navigation laying the groundwork for contemporary touchscreen technology. Number 34. In 1850, H.A. Jackson invented the kitchen table, which provided a dedicated and functional surface for food preparation, dining, and family gatherings in the heart of the home. Number 35. Otis Boykins created an improved version of the pacemaker, a device that regulates the heartbeat. Pacemakers continue to be used to this day and have saved countless lives. Number 36. G.E. Beckett's invented the letterbox in 1857. This provided a secure and convenient way to collect and deliver mail, revolutionizing postal services worldwide. Number 37, George F. Grant's upgraded golf tee, patented in 1899, provided players with more stability and consistency, improving their game and allowing for more accurate strokes. Number 38, in 1932, Richard Spikes invented the automatic gear shift which simplified and enhanced the driving experience by automating gear changes and improving vehicle efficiency and control. Number 39. In 1885, Sarah E. Good's folding bed design offered a space-saving solution for tiny living quarters while still providing convenience and comfort when required. Number 40. The invention of the biscuit cutter by A.P. Ashbourne in 1875 revolutionized the baking industry, providing a tool to create consistent and uniform shapes for biscuits and other pastries. Number 41, Oscar E. Brown's creation of the horseshoe in 1892 provided a reliable and durable footwear solution for horses, protecting their hooves and improving their traction. Number 42, Dr. Shirley Ann Jackson's work in the 1970s helped to create caller ID technology, which allows users to identify incoming phone calls before responding. Number 43, George W. Carver's research and work on paints and stains during the late 19th and early 20th centuries led to advancements in the field of plant-based dyes and pigments. Number 44, A.C. Richardson's invention of the insect destroyer gun in 1876 provided an effective tool for pest control, allowing for the targeted and efficient elimination of insects. Number 45, Joseph Dickinson developed the arm for the record player in 1930, improving the playback of vinyl records by providing a precise and adjustable tone arm mechanism. Number 46, Granville T. Wood's electric cutoff switch invention in 1889 improved electrical safety by providing a mechanism to quickly interrupt or cut off power supply. Number 47, Dr. Thomas Mensah's work in the 1980s helped to build fiber optic connections, which enabled high speed and reliable data transfer across vast distances. Number 48, in 1890, William B. Purvis invented the fountain pen, which eliminated the need for inkwells and quills and provided a more practical and dependable writing device. Number 49. In 1887, Granville T. Woods devised a train-to-station communication system that permitted efficient and secure communication between 
trains and stations, improving railway operations and safety. Number 50. In 1912, James S. Adams's invention in airplane propelling contributed to the evolution of aviation technology by increasing the efficiency and speed of aircraft propulsion systems. Number 51. In 1945, Leonard C. Bailey designed the folding portable baby crib which offered a simple and space-saving alternative for parents while also ensuring a secure and pleasant sleep environment for newborns. Number 52, Gerald A. Lawson's Video Game Console, 1976. Gerald A. Lawson's Video Game Console, which debuted in 1976, pioneered home gaming systems, laying the groundwork for the multi-billion dollar video game industry. Number 53, Lester Lee's innovation in laser fuels in 1986 contributed to the development of more efficient and effective fuel sources for lasers enhancing their performance in various applications. Number 54, N. Relieu's innovation in sugar refinement in 1843 revolutionized the sugar industry by introducing a more efficient and economical process of extracting and purifying sugar. Number 55, Dewey Sanderson's invention of the urinalysis machine in 1945 automated the process of analyzing urine samples, enabling faster and more accurate medical diagnostics. Number 56, W.B. Purvis's improvement to the hand stamp in 1883 facilitated the marking and identification of documents, packages, and other materials, streamlining administrative and organizational processes. Number 57. In 1944, Dr. Vivian Thomas significantly contributed to open-heart surgery methods, developing operations that saved numerous lives and improved cardiac medicine. Number 58. George Cook's innovative automated fishing reel revolutionized fishing by automating the line retrieval procedure, making fishing more efficient and pleasant. Number 59, the coin changer's invention by James A. Bauer in 1881 simplified financial transactions by providing a mechanism to exchange larger denominations for smaller coins, promoting convenience and efficiency. Number 60, John A. Johnson's invention of the wrench in 1922 revolutionized the field of mechanical work by providing a versatile tool for tightening or loosening bolts and nuts. Number 61. Dr. Janet Emerson Bashan is recognized as the first African-American woman to hold a software patent for developing LinkLine software, an innovative web-based system for managing EEO claims and compliance. Number 62. B.F. Jackson's gas burner invention in 1892 enhanced cooking technology by providing a controlled and efficient source of heat for stoves and other gas-powered appliances. Number 63, Dr. Jesse Russell's 1988 invention of the digital cellular base station created the framework for current mobile communication networks allowing broad wireless connections. Number 64, Henry Blair's cotton planter invention in 1834 revolutionized agriculture by mechanizing the process of sowing cotton seeds, increasing efficiency and productivity in farming. Number 65, F. W. Leslie's creation of the envelope seal in 1889 simplified the process of sealing envelopes, ensuring the confidentiality and security of mailed correspondence. Number 66, J. F. Pickering's invention of the blimp in 1901 provided a versatile and maneuverable airship serving purposes such as advertising, surveillance, and transportation. Number 67. In 1892, Albert R. Robinson's electric trolley design transformed urban transportation by offering a cleaner and more efficient alternative to horse-drawn vehicles. Number 68. Paul E. Williams's helicopter design in 1928 advanced vertical flight capabilities, laying the foundation for future developments in aviation and transportation. Number 69. In 1854, Benjamin Montgomery's marine screw propeller enhanced watercraft propulsion, making navigation more efficient and fuel efficient. Number 70. In 1883, Jan Ernst Matzeliger built the motorized shoe lasting machine, which transformed the shoemaking business by automating the lasting process, boosting production speed, and lowering prices. Number 71. Augustus Jackson's innovations in ice cream recipes and production techniques in 1832 helped popularize and refine the frozen treat we enjoy today. Number 72. In 1905, P. Johnson created the eye protector, which offered crucial safety and shielding for the eyes, safeguarding them from potential hazards and injuries in various work environments. Number 73. In 1886, Robert Fleming Jr. invented the guitar, which became a versatile instrument extensively utilized across numerous genres. Number 74. In 1962, James E. West created a magnetic detecting system that changed audio technology, leading to breakthroughs in microphones and other sound recording equipment. Number 75. J. Gregory's invention of the motor in 1872 
revolutionized various industries by providing a reliable and efficient source of mechanical power for driving machines and vehicles. Number 76, H. Bradbury's invention of the torpedo discharger improved naval warfare by providing a mechanism to launch torpedoes from ships, increasing their offensive capabilities. Number 77, in 1899, John Albert Burr invented the lawn mower and revolutionized lawn care by providing a mechanical tool for efficiently cutting grass, enhancing the maintenance of outdoor spaces. Number 78, Michael Harney's lantern invention in 1884 provided portable and reliable illumination for various applications, improving safety and visibility in outdoor and indoor environments. Number 79, Joseph N. Jackson's invention of programmable remote controllers in 1961 revolutionized home entertainment, providing convenient and customizable control over various electronic devices. Number 80, W.M. Harwell's 1981 invention of the space shuttle retrieval arm facilitated the safe and efficient maneuvering of payloads during space shuttle missions. Number 81, Granville T. Wood's relay instrument invention in 1887 enhanced telegraphy and railway signaling systems by improving the efficiency and reliability of electrical relay operations. 82, Lydia O. Newman's hairbrush invention in 1898 included synthetic bristles, creating a more sanitary and durable grooming instrument. Number 83, Joseph A. Smith's invention of the lawn sprinkler in 1897 facilitated the irrigation of lawns and gardens, ensuring proper hydration for plants and promoting healthy growth. Number 84, Jones and Long's invention of bottle caps in 1892 revolutionized the beverage industry by providing a secure and hygienic seal for bottles, preserving the freshness and carbonation of drinks. Number 85, in 1843, Washington. Lavalette's invention revolutionized the field of publishing by improving the printing press innovation and enabling the mass production of books, newspapers, and other printed materials. Number 86, Alfred Benjamin's creation of stainless steel pads in 1901 introduced a durable and rust-resistant material for various applications, enhancing their longevity and effectiveness. Number 87, Solomon Harper's creation of thermo hair curlers in 1930 introduced a safer and more convenient way to achieve curls by utilizing heat, replacing traditional curling methods. Number 88. In 1914, Adolf Schams invented the multi-stage rocket, which enabled the efficient deployment of payloads into space, laying the foundation for modern space exploration and satellite launches. Number 89. In 1939, Frederick M. Jones invented the starter generator and revolutionized automotive technology by combining the functions of a starter motor and generator, improving engine efficiency. Number 90, the egg beater was invented by W. Johnson. Number 91, in 1897, Andrew J. Beard invented the railroad track switch, which enhanced railway transit safety by providing a dependable mechanism for switching train tracks. Number 92, in 1883, Jan Ernst Matzeliger built an automated shoe manufacturing system that revolutionized the shoe business by enhancing production efficiency and lowering manpower needs. Number 93, in 1834, Henry Blair invented the corn planter, which increased crop productivity by automating the process of sowing corn seeds. Number 94. In 1971, Henry Sampson was awarded a patent for the invention of the gamma electric cell. Oh, Number black 95. Man. In 1872, black Thomas J. Martin's improved fire extinguisher design boosted fire suppression efficacy, giving a safer technique for controlling and extinguishing flames. Number 96. In 1869, Isaac R. Johnson invented the Velocipede, an early version of the bicycle, laying the groundwork for contemporary transportation and recreational riding. Number 97, George W. Carver invented lotion and soap. Number 98, Maurice W. Lee invented the aromatic pressure cooler and snooker. Number 99, William Richardson invented the first self-propelled baby stroller. Number 100, in 1887, William B. Purvis improved the portable weighing scale making it more compact and accurate, allowing for more convenient and exact weight measurements. We refrain from digging into the deep specifics of each innovation due to the lengthy size of the list, which includes an amazing 100 entries. Furthermore, the list is... Now, to the racist people, stick that, stick that. They invented everything. And those who continued it with the racism. special topic that will showcase the ingenuity, creativity, and perseverance of a group of people that has often been overlooked in the annals of history. 
We are going to talk about black inventors whose amazing inventions have contributed to modern technology. But before we delve into the exciting world of innovation, let us pause for a moment and reflect on black history. The history of black people in America is a story of struggle, oppression, and discrimination. For centuries, black people were treated as second-class citizens, denied basic human rights, and subjected to unspeakable acts of violence and cruelty. From slavery to segregation, the road to freedom and equality has been long and arduous. But despite all the obstacles, African Americans never gave up. They fought for their rights, their dignity, and their place in society. And one of the ways they did this was through innovation. Yes, you heard that right. Innovation. Despite being denied education, resources, and opportunities, black inventors were able to come up with groundbreaking ideas and inventions that revolutionized the world. Did you know that the first black inventor to receive a patent was Thomas L. Jennings, who invented a dry cleaning process in 1821? Or that Granville T. Woods, known as the Black Edison, invented more than a dozen devices that revolutionized the railroad industry in the late 1800s? And what about George Washington Carver, whose research on peanuts helped revolutionize agriculture and food production? These are just a few examples of the many black inventors who have made significant contributions to modern technology. From traffic lights to blood banks, from the super soaker water gun to the modern gas mask, black inventors have left their mark on the world. So join me as we explore the fascinating world of black inventors and their amazing contributions to modern technology. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe to get more content like this. Roy Clay, computer science pioneer. The first on our list is a man that is considered the godfather of Silicon Valley, and this is because of his long list of contributions to modern technology. In the 1960s, Clay began working with Fairchild Semiconductor, where he played a crucial role in the development of the company's computer division. It was during his time at Fairchild that Clay made some of his most significant contributions to the field of computer science. One of Clay's most notable achievements was the development of the first computer chipset, which allowed multiple circuits to be integrated into a single chip. This innovation laid the foundation for the development of modern microprocessors, which are used in everything from smartphones to supercomputers. Clay also played a key role in the development of the first mini-computer, which was a smaller, more affordable alternative to the large, expensive mainframe computers that were in use at the time. The development of the mini-computer made computing more accessible to businesses and individuals and paved the way for the personal computer revolution of the 1980s. In addition to his work at Fairchild, Clay also founded his own technology company, Rod L. Electronics, in 1970. The company focused on developing innovative computer products, including some of the first computer networking devices. Throughout his career, Clay was not only a pioneering engineer and innovator, but also a mentor to countless other engineers and entrepreneurs. He served on the boards of several technology companies, including Intel and Apple, and was a founding member of the computer division at Hewlett Packard. Despite his many accomplishments, Clay's contributions to the field of computer science have often been overlooked. As a black man working in a predominantly white field, he faced significant discrimination and obstacles throughout his career. However, his legacy lives on through the many innovations he helped to develop and the countless individuals he inspired and mentored along the way. Joseph A. Smith, the Lawn Sprinkler. Joseph A. Smith was an African-American inventor born in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1867. He was an entrepreneur and inventor, and his invention of the Lawn Sprinkler revolutionized the way people irrigated their lawns and gardens. The idea for the lawn sprinkler came to him while he was working as a gardener in Ohio. He noticed that the plants that were watered by hand grew healthier than those that were not watered. He also saw that many people were wasting water by using hoses to water their lawns and gardens. Smith was determined to find a more efficient way to water plants, and he began to experiment with different types of irrigation systems. He eventually developed a lawn sprinkler that could be attached to a hose and used to water lawns and gardens. His lawn sprinkler was unique because it was adjustable and could be set to water specific areas of the lawn or garden. It was also designed to conserve water by using a system of rotating nozzles that sprayed water in a circular pattern, rather than wasting water by spraying it all over the place. Smith's lawn sprinkler was patented in 1897 
and it quickly became popular with homeowners and landscapers. It was especially useful in areas where water was scarce or where watering restrictions were in place. We can say Joseph Smith's invention of the lawn sprinkler had a lasting impact on modern technology and has helped to make our world a better place. Today, lawn sprinklers are used not only in residential settings, but also in commercial agriculture. Charles Richard, The Blood Banks. Charles Richard was an African-American physician and accomplished surgeon who would revolutionize the healthcare system in the U.S. Richard had an interest in blood transfusions and the importance of having a readily available supply of blood for medical emergencies. He understood that blood loss could be a major cause of death in surgeries and other medical procedures. In 1938, Richard... Ain't that something? What I Dr. Mary Van Britten Brown, the 
home security system. Like other inventors, necessity drove Dr. Mary Van Britten Brown to discover one of the most important technological devices we still use today. Her home was located in a high crime area, and she was concerned about her personal safety, especially when her husband was away at work. Her concerns were heightened by the fact that the police in her area were often slow to respond to calls for help. In response to these concerns, Brown and her husband, Albert Brown, who was an electronics technician, set about creating a new kind of home security system. The device that they developed consisted of a camera that was mounted on a peephole in the front door of the house. This camera was connected to a monitor inside the house, allowing the occupants to see who was at the door without opening it. The system also included a set of microphones that were placed at strategic locations around the house. These microphones were connected to a speaker in the front door, allowing the occupants to communicate with visitors without opening the door. In addition, the device had a panic button that could be pressed in case of an emergency, and it would immediately alert the police. The device was patented in 1966, and it changed the home security industry forever. The invention was groundbreaking as it allowed homeowners to monitor their homes and communicate with visitors without putting themselves at risk. This was especially important for women living alone or families with children. The device was also a precursor to the modern-day closed-circuit television CCTV systems that are commonly used in homes and businesses today. Garrett Morgan, the three-light traffic signal. Garrett Morgan was born in Kentucky in 1877, but would move to Cleveland, Ohio at the age of 18, where he started his own sewing machine repair business and went on to establish a tailoring business that catered to wealthy customers. Despite having limited education, Morgan was a curious and innovative person who was always looking for new ways to improve his community. In 1923, Morgan witnessed a terrible accident between a horse-drawn carriage and an automobile on a busy Cleveland street. Um, I'm gonna cut this short, uh, cause, uh, yeah, but, um, before I go, before I go, uh, I just want to let you know, for those people that watch this video, and for the, you know, when they, when they talk about black people, they always show the dysfunction of us, but, and they tell us to stay away from black Americans. It's funny, and I made this video because what people believe on see on TV and black culture, they they have no idea that's another side of us that they don't like to tell about us. This is the reason why I made this video, and because they don't want you marrying or being friends with black people and so on and so on. They think that make you feel like your skin is a curse, your features is a curse. Say that you're not, you have a mind of an animal and everything. But I had to show you, show, break, bust it down. And anybody that come over here or been over here in this country, they will never look at black people. You show them this video, they'll never look at black people the same again. And as, as, as black Americans, we deserve our respect. We invented everything. So many things you you sitting on, everything you seeing, now that's the proof. That's the proof. We invented stuff. That that plays a part in American society. But they don't want to tell you that. They might you think that you see the black and it, I know it's hard to believe some people believe that because you what the, the T V programs, the program that we illiterate, we don't know how to talk, you know. But there's, there's a segment of black people out here that are, are, are smart. But you, but, but they, you see how they commercialize us. But they don't tell us, they t tell you about who invented. So, for those people who are non black, hope you show the ones who have, show the ones who have the prejudice who we really are. Share this video. Show them who we really are. That we're not just musicians and, 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 and athletes. Show them. Show them.
I did that really show you that because the prejudice motivated to past times and stereotypes to this day. That's why I showed the video. So I want, please share this video with somebody and educate. That's why I made this video. And for the black men and black women out there in America, no matter how dark you are to the lightest, the fair complexion, you were the chosen all along. Don't let com your complexion, don't let your features deter you from what they said. Because you see, the people that came before you have brilliant minds. That's what they want to tell you about. And it's probably brilliant more generations as we speak in the land that we is, and many more is to come. Don't abort your babies, because they, that's what they can come out to. That's why they could be the next person to mention. I hope you like this video, share with somebody, like, subscribe. Till next time, take care, be blessed, and like me, and hold your head up. We, we, we visible to each other. We're not invisible to most. We're not invisible. Be visible. Remember that. You you got you God's chosen. No matter what the world says, no matter what other people say. No matter what they, they keep pushing generation after generation. No matter what part, and if it's somebody black outside of the United States, you have a gift too. And I hope it translates to it in French, Spanish, and everything. You're not animals. That's a lie. The ones that the animals to call you the animal. From one end to the other. Stay, stay, stay prayed up. Hang in there. And I wish someone could translate this into them different languages. Stay up. That's who we are in America. Your, your brothers and sisters in the skin, that's what they accomplished, man. Don't let them tell you that we're a bunch of idiots. That we're a bunch of inbreds. That we're less educated. That's a lie. That's why I made this video. Like and subscribe. Take care.